Welcome everybody to Funeral Nation episode 246. That's the funeral commander, Jeff Harbison. I'm Ryan Thogmartin, and we're back from ICCFA. Well, back with stops in between because, well, we just travel a lot and do work. Yeah, you've been in New York. I'm actually right now in San Diego, San Diego. San Diego. Yeah, Ron Burgundy and I had a little meeting a little while ago, so I'm getting some tips from him. But uh, anyway, before we get started, hey, look, the fuel doesn't happen. Or excuse me, the engine doesn't run unless the fuel's on here. You know, like that plane behind me over there at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, it's got to be CNJ Financial. If the funeral's not paid for, it's not over with yet. So let's run their promo. We may be the largest insurance assignment company in the funeral profession, but that doesn't mean we've lost touch with our roots. Here in Rainbow City, Alabama, our priorities still come down to a welcoming smile and a handshake that says we keep our promises. With all the tools and technologies that assure blazing fast turnaround, what really matters is much more old school. Personal responsibility, integrity, relationships, and the pride that comes from hearing yet another client say, you came through for us when it mattered. CNJ eliminates the challenges that funeral homes have in processing insurance death claims. If cash flow is vital to your business, welcome home. Hi, right, Ryan. Look, uh, we're just coming back from ICCFA last week. Um, we've got a little bit to talk about here. And let's start off with you, uh, observations. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Um, for us, the, the show went well. Uh, you know, it, we had a lot of great conversations because we do create our own exposure while we're there to, to draw attention and, and things. So overall, it was a good convention. It was a very underattended convention. Um, I will say that I heard that from most of the suppliers felt like the foot traffic was very low. Um, However, I would agree our booth was pretty busy, though. I know your booth was pretty busy because we do a lot. We don't just rely on ICCFA to bring the people. We do a lot to create traffic and, and get people in to have conversations. I will say that we had some very deep, long conversations that aren't typical at, you know, at a convention booth. It's usually quick interaction, sign up for a demo, go along. But we did have a lot of good strategic conversations and it was high level conversation. So that was great to see. I think the caliber of conversation has ramped up over the last few years. Uh, I would agree with you that, uh, again, there was no secret. It was not attended very well by uh, what I would consider should be with funeral homes out of an organization that has, you know, several thousand. However, uh, as you said, there's a bright, bright spot, and all of us that were there, I believe that we made the best of what we had yeah. and came away with, you know, something for everybody. So I'm going to chalk it up as, you know, a success, but uh, certainly going to have to work on attendance. And I don't know if changing the location, the venue, you know, the last day, they, we, could just, we could just have two days open. There's no sense in having three days there, literally. No. I mean, yeah, no, I'm with you there. Yeah, resume day, um, just shut it down. All right, we'll have it on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and let it go after that. Um, we're going to break for one of our folks, our sponsors, and educational pieces with Legacy in a second. But before we get going, I have to recognize Dale out of Montego Bay, Jamaica. Yes, let's throw hey, that look, image uh, up. We've got this picture. We'll have to have that posted with this. But Dale is a loyal Funeral Nation fan, and man, we're going to have to come down there and film a couple segments with you, Dale. But thank you for being an FNer. Yeah, he, he sought you out and said, hey, I'm here to see the commander. Yeah, I was like, hey, dude, how are you? You are in right the place I want to be. So let's run uh, Legacies. They're giving an educational piece. So let's go ahead and run that. Happy New Year 2022. I'm Stouffer Bartle, founder and CEO of Legacy.com. People will ask what inspired me to start Legacy in the first place, and I always enjoy sharing the story of funeral directors in particular because of their special relationship with Legacy's early days. It was the year 1998. There was one way people announced someone's death, and it was in the print pages of the local newspaper. 
Nearly everyone who died was remembered with a newspaper obituary or death notice. Most newspapers would also select a couple people each day for whom they'd set aside extra space to write a lengthier, richer obituary detailing their life story. Funeral directors would help families submit obituaries to newspapers much like today, but most families felt that their loved one deserved that longer story in print, and it was the funeral director's job to let them know there wasn't room in the paper for everyone to get that featured obit written by the newspaper. So we had an idea. If this thing called the internet could help people publish job listings, personal ads, or even pornography, why couldn't it give everyone the chance to have an obituary worthy of their life? Why couldn't my grandfather, an immigrant farmer in the upper peninsula of Michigan, who lived an incredible life of 100 years, mostly in obscurity, have the same kind of obituary as these so-called noteworthy people in the newspaper pages? So we at Legacy had a plan and it included funeral directors. In 1999, we set up a booth in Kansas City at our first NFDA show. And that year we made literally hundreds of in-person visits to funeral homes across Chicagoland and the country, promoting our online obituary program to funeral directors in hopes that they would offer it as an option to their families. Funeral directors for the most part are some of the kindest souls I've met. I've learned this both by observing what they do for the families they serve, but also in how nicely they treated us. They welcomed hearing our pitch, even though we might as well have been aliens from outer space, because in 1999, most funeral directors weren't really online yet. And the last thing they were going to do is try to explain this internet obituary thing to families, some of whom uh, weren't online either. So legacy was too early. Worse yet, we weren't smart enough to realize this for about two years, and we nearly went bankrupt. As luck would have it though, a local newspaper heard we were trying to do what we were trying to do and they asked if we could help them bring their print obituaries to life by bringing them online. And of course the rest is history. Soon we were powering online obituary sections for newspapers nationwide. But even while working with newspapers, we had the interests of local funeral directors in mind. And to this day, we regularly encourage our newspaper partners to more effectively embrace the needs of all funeral service professionals you know, with varying degrees of success. In 2021, however, our story went full circle and we began offering more services directly to funeral homes, including, yes, opportunities to help the life stories of the families they serve be told in full and reach more people than ever. This year, we'll be introducing even more ways that funeral directors can leverage Legacy's enormous reach to help their families tell the stories of their loved ones, while also helping people everywhere know more about the local funeral home that served that family. At Legacy, we hope this happens in a 2022 that has finally begun to heal from the many challenges of the last couple of years. Thanks for listening. Hi, Ryan. So observations uh, back. Coolest thing I saw before the show even got started, um, I had the guy from Charity Box come to me once again, seeking me out because he's watched a show. He knew who you were. Uh, went over there and an ATM me uh, ATM basically machine hookup that you can donate on the spot in the funeral home. It has some other features, uh, a guest book, etc. But that was the most innovative thing I saw there. How about you? Yeah, I I mean I I have to agree. You introduced me to to the the AT, I call him the ATM guy, Charity Box. Uh, I do love that concept of making it that easy, like, like you're using an ATM to be able to donate. I think that's cool. Um, look, I was probably the thing that I saw that I was most happy about was the evolution in the technology with live streaming. The companies that were there, live streaming has to be a part of a funeral service now, offering it. As big of a Facebook guy as I am, Facebook should not be your your, your, your single outlet for live streaming. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. You play music, it's coming down. Now you don't have it. Um, so there, there were a handful of companies there, uh, funeral web, memorial streams, um, Faveo with really cool mobile technology that literally you need an iPhone and an app and, and you can do on demand recording and streaming. So I, I am excited about that technology because 2008 was my first NFDA convention, and I think there were probably 10 to a dozen uh, web stream company. I mean, they were everywhere, and then they just all disappeared, and less than 25% of funeral homes had the ability to live stream pre-pandemic, and now it's, it's an absolute must to at least have it available. So 
I'm, I'm a, I was excited about that technology evolution, I guess, but still it's not, it is what it is, you know, it's live streaming, yeah. but it's easy. And I, I had some time obviously to go out and meet some new vendors, saw some pretty cool stuff. Um, this is not a new uh, supplier vendor, but uh, full circle aftercare, I was actually enamored with because what I saw with them is they just don't give you platforms or go to this website or do this. They actually, which I didn't know, but a big shout out to Matthew and his team. They actually assign a family uh, to a person in their business. And that person helps guide them through shut down uh, sites. They not only do that, but, you know, uh, help to uh, get their social security, help with life insurance. Right. And so that was something I learned that I really didn't know as well as I thought I did. And so I have to give a shout out to them. Yeah. Good. I love it. I mean, look, it's weeks. I, I think we had a pretty high expectations for this conference based on like, it hasn't been around for the last couple of years, except for virtual. We thought there would be a lot more people. There wasn't, but I was pleased with the technology advances and, and where the conversation has gone with funeral homes. Um, if anything, when we talked about before, the pandemic has ramped that conversation up and funeral homes have had to adapt and it's making it uh, easier to get in line with what the consumer wants. There, there's yeah, there, I mean, the things we're are there. catching up to the 20th century. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That. That's so right. anyway, speaking of uh, really great folks that work well, we also have an educational piece here. Yeah. Uh, Precious Metals Refining Service. Drew and Melissa, awesome people. We got to spend some time with them. Uh, let's roll their educational piece. Hey everyone, my name is Melissa Polis and this is Drew Osberg. Hey guys. And we're with PMRS. We are thrilled to be on Funeral Nation with you today, sharing our knowledge that we've gained from visiting different funeral homes and crematories across the nation. Today we're talking about transparency with families around metal recycling. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic always. We always have great conversations with lots of owners uh, and funeral directors, mainly from locations that are adding new crematories to their sites. Uh, the topic always seems to come up, you know, what is the conversation that I should have with a family um, when they ask me about um, metals that are coming out of uh, the deceased during the uh, cremation process? Uh, the reality is, is inside your cremation authorization forms, there's already clauses in there that kind of explain that the metals are becoming property of the crematory uh, after the cremation process happens. Um, but on the flip side of the coin, uh, the more human element of uh, the, the conversation is really that you should be equipping your funeral directors and preparing them to have these conversations. They don't happen often, but they do happen. Uh, and when they happen, it's, it's really giving them the confidence to speak to a family on that. Um, what we found along the way is that different crematories across the country, uh, they like to share the charities that they are donating to, um, you know, the proceeds to. So it, it, I think it's a great way to do it. But we really encourage you guys to speak to your peers inside of your community that are also cremating um, for funeral homes around the area and see how they handle it. Um, because there's nothing better to, to, to share than to share that you're donating uh, to charity and to be transparent with the families that you're serving. And that's what matters. Yeah. Thank you so much to Funeral Nation for having us. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. You know, a conversation with Drew and Melissa, like the data that they have, like I think that's the thing that gets me excited about them the most is the back end data they have of just how much is being left on the table from the, the, the collecting of precious metals. It's, it's pretty interesting. And some of the things that they're helping funeral homes do with the refining of that and the money that comes from it to, to give back and in, in different projects is pretty fascinating. Yeah. I had the opportunity to meet them actually on site at one of our shared clients and uh, they really do have their act together. And yeah. again, Drew's a data guy. I guess that's yep. why I started with, uh, with the D as parents knew what was foretold. <sighs> Look, I got to get back in this meeting over here. We want to make sure that we followed up here. Do you have any comments or things that you saw there that you really like you want to bring up? How about let us know? Uh, we do have expectations that this will grow, but we'll see, you know, what happens. It, uh, I'll say this. It wasn't an NFDA, which, you know, obviously is, is somewhat of a different audience. Yeah. However, um, 
it didn't have the same feeling either to me. How about you? No, I, I would agree. And, and I think maybe we had expectations that were too high because like of in Nashville, you know, yeah, I, was, because, I went yeah. in there thinking that we were going to have something similar, but either way, either way is valuable. most yep. people I talked to that are on the supplier side found it successful. So that means I believe that people that were in attendance, um, that they found some success there too. Look, anyway, you, were, bro, you weren't there unless you wanted to be there. And that's the thing. Like funeral directors were there because they wanted to be there and they wanted to get something out of it. So that's valuable for suppliers. I'm going to go jump on one of these planes over here and get my picture made. So uh, anyway, it, man. I'll don't mess the hair up. Oh, don't worry about this. This is aerodynamic, brother. Until next time, have a great effing week. Out here.